Good morning. I'm glad you could be with me today as we're in God's Word together in the Unfolding the Word ministry. If you've been with me for a while, you know we've been in the midst of a study of 1 John, that first epistle of John. We're now in the fourth chapter, and I want to pick up our reading today in verse 7. Looking at verse 7 and 8, we began to look at these yesterday. If you were with me, you remember that. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. We've been talking about the command of love, how it is a translation in these cases of the Greek word agape, which refers to God's love, that, sun, that central selfless response that is inherent to God. 1 Corinthians 13, if you remember, gives us a definition of what that love is all about because that love chapter of the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 7, 13, is a translation of the Greek word agape. We saw already in 1 John that the core example that helps us to understand what is God's love all about, what is the selflessness and self-giving nature of it, was seen in Jesus Christ himself and in his giving of his life at the cross for us. Yesterday, in building on that, we were talking about how yet once again the command to show agape is repeated. A frequent, repetitious command, not only in 1 John, but throughout the scriptures. Uh, and when we see that happen in the scriptures, the very fact of the repetition underscores for us that this is an issue that God takes very seriously. And as a challenge, he wants us not to miss. In fact, as we studied yesterday, it becomes a key proof of our salvation and discipleship. It's a key proof to show that we really know God. And the word know, as you were with me yesterday, is not the Greek word oidon or adon, which refers to factual knowledge. It is the form of the Greek word nosko, which means relational knowledge. And one of the proofs that we know God in terms of have relationship with him is seen in our commitment to expressing love in agape. Now that's our bridge to today because I want to concentrate today on the eighth verse. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. We need to recognize as we're now studying through 1 John, but it's true throughout the scriptures, that agape is part of God's very nature. It is one of his attributes. Now we use that word attribute, the theologians use that word, to describe those characteristics of God. An attribute of someone is its core characteristic, an inherent part of what someone or something is. The scripture gives us many insights into the very nature of God, into those characteristics that are part of who he is. The attributes that the scripture identify us identify for us help to answer the question, what is the God who is really there actually like? <laughs> so you follow? Attributes are very important. God is a self-revealing God. One of the wonders of the scriptures is that it is God's revelation to us that introduces us to what he is really like. Oh, creation shows us something of his power and so forth, but the scriptures give us that clear definition of what God is really like. The Bible gives us many of the attributes of God. God goes to great length to not leave us in confusion about what he is really like. Now, why does God do that? And the answer to that is that mankind, you and I, are essentially idolatrous by nature. In other words, you and I have an inclination always to create God in our own minds, to make the God that we worship a God that we want him to be like. Our understanding of God does not reflect what he's revealed about himself. It reflects what we want to be true about him. Most people's image of God is incorrect, and the scriptures correct our understanding of God. We see him for who he really is and how he reveals himself. You know, it's not uncommon as I'm teaching the word of God, and we come to a passage, and 
and the passage is telling us something about what God says and how he how he's oriented to life or what he warns us against, then someone will come to me and say, well, you know, I don't really see God like that. Well, therein is the problem. And I will lovingly share with somebody, well, I'm sorry to hear about your idolatry, but isn't it wonderful that we're in God's word so that these very points in which you are idolatrous as a person can be corrected? In other words, your image of God is wrong. And I can say that with authority if somebody's image of God is in conflict with what God reveals about himself in the scriptures. May we all be in a process of cleansing our minds from idolatrous ideas about God and see God as he reveals himself to be in the scriptures. The word of God is the only place we can turn to correct such thinking. It doesn't happen because we get off by ourselves in a retreat somewhere, off by ourselves in some sort of mystical experience. No, no. The only place we know objectively of who God is, is in his word as he's revealed it to us. Well, in 1 John, God, God has been introducing us to a number of his characteristics of his attributes. Back in the first chapter, in verse 5, it says, God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. So we see one of God's very attributes is the self-revealing of the truthfulness of life and the reality of it. He is light. There's no lie within him, no darkness. In 1 John 1, 9, we encountered that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just and will forgive us our sins. We see that God is a faithful God. It is his characteristic to be faithful. It is his characteristic to be just. In the third chapter is another example in verse 3 of 1 John. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. God is pure, holy, without sin. That's one of his attributes. Later on in verse 7 of chapter 3, it says, Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Our Heavenly Father is a righteous God, perfect in all of his ways. Many attributes have been identified for us thus far in 1 John. Now we add love, agape, to those attribute lists. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. God's attributes, remember, are his innate characteristics. If these are part of what make God up, then God will always be acting in harmony with his attributes. All of his actions reflect those attributes. All of his actions reflect all of his attributes. In other words, God is love, but that love does not allow him to act in ways contrary to the fact that he is just or that he is holy. Does that make sense to you? All of the attributes are always true of God. God will always act in accord with agape, with love, but he has to work in accord with love in a way that also is in accord with the fact that he is just that he is holy, that he is righteous, and so forth. That is the reason, by the way, that the cross was necessary. Why, that was the reason why he had to send his only son into this world to live and to die for our sin, because it was the only way in, he, in which we could, as unjust people, become justified if his love would act in a way and lead God to act in a way that would allow his holiness and his justice and his righteousness to also be satisfied. That's why the cross was necessary. An understanding of God's very nature shows us why the cross was crucial. Now, one other comment I want to make about this today. We have to be careful that we don't reverse the word order here. In English, word order is very important, and we need to be cautious about it. To say that God is love does not mean the same thing as to say love is God. It's more than a basic grammar error. Because if we don't see that we can't reverse word order, it will lead us into doctrinal difficulties. 
Such an error is to say, well, not only is God love, but love is God, depersonalizes God. It promotes sort of a pantheistic picture of things. No, God is love, but not all that we call love is God. <laughs> do, you make this, do you see the distinction? Well, I hope you do. It's more than an abstract one. It's a characteristic that is personalized to the God who is really there. Well, join me tomorrow as we continue on in the verses ahead and see how Jesus Christ demonstrates for us more the meaning of God's love. Have a good day. God bless.